Hello and welcome to episode 264 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. Join me as always is the glorious League Freak, who you can find on Twitter at League Freak. How are you going there, mate? Very good, Andrew. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, we're doing something new today. Yeah, we thought that we'd change the entire format of our podcast and actually do a Rugby League history episode. Yeah, I mean, you've only been waiting for it, people, for, what, seven, eight months? Yeah, we we said that we had this one in the pipeline along along with about six others. So yes. that means this one's going to be really good. There's been yeah. a lot of preparation put into this. Absolutely, absolutely. Many years ago. <laughs> so anyway, today's episode is going to be about Pat Walsh. Um, he was a Newcastle Rugby League and Rugby Union um player back prior to rugby league's birth and we'll get into it there's a a certain moment later in his career which was uh not quite a catalyst but not far off for rugby league forming in australia yeah he's got a really interesting story and uh i'm looking forward to this one i always enjoy episodes where i feel as though i learn a little bit about the game well this bloke's um i mean first of all You'll, you'll realise as we get through it all that um, this bloke was possibly the one of the first generally naturally gifted athletes that, mm. uh, that's existed in the game because not only could he play a few positions on the field, but he could play several sports at an elite level. And switch between one or the other really quickly. Mm. So um, he was born in Cooks Hill in Newcastle in 1879. Um, and at school he won medals for running track and field and in 1895 at the age of 16 he received a medal for being the best cricket all-rounder at the school um the following year at the age of 17 he left school to work as a railway porter he joined the norwoods rugby union club and was an integral member of the undefeated side who also avoided conceding a single point during the 1896 season wow that's amazing (laughs) i've never heard anything like that in uh in a major sporting competition like a rugby union, rugby league, soccer even. That's pure dominance. Yeah. Um, in 1897, uh, he and his teammates were presented with medals to commemorate their previous season's feats. Uh, while he was walking along a city wharf, the medal fell off his waistcoat chain. He returned half an hour later to find his medal had been crushed by a cart and the gold inlay was missing. He kept the damaged metal remnants, which remained one of his prized possessions anyway. That took a bit of a while to figure, find that story. Um, so he didn't mind that parts of it were missing. He just wanted the medal as that recognition of, you know, the great achievement they did. He didn't care how dinged up and banged up it was. Yeah, do you know if anyone's still got that medal? I, I don't know. There's a fair chance um, his grandson might. Um, yeah. His grandson's been... Uh, he helped me with some of this uh, article. Okay. And he, he's been able to do a fair bit of, uh, you know... Research, I guess, on his own about his about his own granddad. So it's a as we as we get into it, I mean, a pretty phenomenal story. Mm. Um, in eighteen ninety eight, a residential system was introduced, forcing players to join the team representing the district where they lived. Um, as we've spoken in one of our very first episodes, I mean, this system was in place for a long, long time, several decades. Yeah, it was just um, part of sport, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in it was in rugby union. I think it may have even started in cricket mm-hmm. from memory and well, you think just about, the... well you think about cricket i mean it was only about 20 years ago where sheffield shield players could play for a different state yeah that's the thing it's um it's, it's amazing how some of these rules just hang around and people think nothing of them mm-hmm. um so walsh and other players from the norwoods and carlton clubs formed the newcastle central team for the 1899 season and they won the premiership that year he would go on to win another four premierships with that club. Wow. Um, in 1899, he was selected to represent Northern Districts against the touring British Rugby Union team, which contained a player by the name of Blair Swannell, who Walsh would have several clashes with in his career. Um, he played for Northern Districts again in 1900, and in 1902, he was instrumental in the 18-6 victory against the more fancied Sydney Met- Metropolis side. So we're already seeing already that whatever this guy does, success is, it just follows him around. He's just one of those players. 
He's a winner, yeah. It's interesting that some players are like that. Yeah, I mean, a modern-day version of that would be someone like James Maloney. Mm-hmm. Take him anywhere, he just wins. Yep. Um, in 1903, he moved to the Carlton Club in Newcastle, where he was soon regarded as one of the premier forwards in New South Wales. He was selected in the combined countryside that played against Metropolis and the touring Kiwi side before earning his first cap for New South Wales uh, when he played against Queensland. In 1904, he made his debut for the Wallabies against Great Britain. Despite his own good performance, the Wallabies went down 17-0. Joining him in the Australian team that day were future rugby league pioneers Alec Burden and Dini Lucky. Walsh's opponent in that British side was Blair Swannell. And apparently they had a few heavy clashes through the game as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shortly after that test, Walsh lined up for the Northern Districts team against the British. During that game, he had a collision with British winger Fred Jowett, which caused the winger to retire from the game with concussion. The tourists went after Walsh, and they went right after him, you know, illegal shots and, you know, hitting him around the head and trying to smash him as hard as they could. Mm-hmm. But he finished the game. He's tough. Skillful, yeah. tough winner. <clears throat> now, this is the game I was alluding to at the start, because during this game, it was alleged that British player Dennis Dobson swore at the referee Harry Dolan. Dobson was immediately sent off. England's captain David Bedell Sivright was incensed at the decision and ordered his team to leave the field as a protest. Oh. But soon they came back on the field. <clears throat> Walsh was one of five Northern Districts players that supported the referee's decision at an ensuing investigation into the what was known as the Dobson incident by the New South Wales Rugby Union. However... <coughs> Sorry, the New South Wales Rugby Union surprisingly sided with the English players, claiming that the referee had heard wrong. This would prove to be a catastrophic decision by the New South Wales Rugby Union. Now, there's a few theories as to why they may have done this, you know, and they're just theories. Yeah. Um, Some would suggest that the New South Wales Rugby Union didn't want to upset the British because they brought a lot of money in through the tours. Yeah, yeah. So keep them happy, keep the tour going, keep the money rolling in. So that was probably the main reason behind all of that. I can also see where the players would be not too happy that another player was siding with the official like that. Well, that's that's pretty much what happened, is a lot of the players did get, um, I suppose they felt a bit let down by their own governing body. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Walsh played in the second test of Brisbane shortly after, but the British were again too strong, winning 17-3. to Blair Swannell flattened Walsh in what appeared to be a very personal vendetta. Um, the Wallabies lost the third test 16-0, yet yeah, yeah, Walsh was still one of the few shining lights for the Australian team. Uh, Walsh and the British squared off one loss last time on that tour when New South Wales played the Tourists in their last tour match. The game was dominated by very, very heavy clashes in the forwards, mostly targeting and involving Walsh. So, again, they went after him, and again, he held his own and probably even dished his own back. He was not yeah. not the sort of player that copped it and, and laid down. Yeah, yeah. Um, he played again for New South Wales in 1905 and was still considered one of the best three players in, for New South Wales um, that year. He then led New South Wales to victory against Queensland shortly after that in 1905, and the praise for his performance was great, wide-reaching, and unanimous. Some saying he played grandly, he played a brilliant game, and many suggesting that he was Australia's best forward. Oh, wow. So he's not taken long to get into the test side and then prove that he is the best forward in Australia. Yeah, one of their elite players, yeah. And commentators in New South Wales and Queensland were saying this. Yeah. However, <clears throat> and this is where things start to, I suppose, get interesting here. Yeah. It was deemed that he had not played well enough to, to retain his place in the state side for the upcoming match against the Kiwis. And he was replaced by none other than Blair Swannell, the British tourist who had stayed in Australia and was playing for North Sydney. Wow. <laughs> I can see where that did not sit well with him at all. This is exactly right. Now, his admission to this day is one of the most baffling made in either rugby code in Australia. Uh, The referee, uh, uh, that was a sporting magazine in Sydney at the time, reported that 
Walsh's exclusion is simply a Chinese puzzle. After state selectors suggested that his form had dropped in the last two games, despite all the media reports saying that he was the best player in, in Australia. Mm-hmm. Now, after the third game in which he didn't play, the New South Wales squad was selected for an end of season tour to New Zealand and Walsh was not selected in that squad. Oh, wow. He then captained the New South Wales side uh, in, at club level to a convincing 30-0 to nil victory, putting in a best on field display, scoring three tries. It was his last chance to get a call up into the squad. The selectors watched him, the media raved about him, and they still refused to pick him. Far out. It's interesting that uh, it all turned on him very quickly. Yes. Um, the Arrow newspaper reported, if the Australian team to visit New Zealand included Walsh, one would have no fear as to the forwards holding their own against anything in New Zealand. There is no better forward in Australia than Walsh. Probably no one quite as good. In the Newcastle district, the Dobson incident inquiry is thought to have in some way prejudiced Walsh's chances of being selected. It is clear that the Newcastle forward has not been admitted on the ground of his ability of not being good enough. <coughs> so, the media is making it very clear that there's other reasons behind this and they're yeah. not very fair. Yeah, yeah. And that's not been done subtly either. <clears throat> no, clearly not. I mean, the other way you can sort of compare is if you were to have, say, I don't know, for some reason, Roger Tuivasa-Sheck is just not being picked for New Zealand anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, Walsh then played for Carlton in the grand final against Newcastle. Carlton had lost to Newcastle three times during the year, each time when Walsh didn't play because he was on rep duty. But in this game, and 10 minutes before full-time, with Carlton holding just a 2-0 lead, Walsh gathered the ball and ran 20 yards to score between the posts, giving Carlton a 9-0 victory mm-hmm. and the premiership. Wow. Another still, win. Still didn't get picked. That's crazy. <laughs> so, he was obviously at this point fed up. Mm. He made a snap decision on the spot to travel, for some reason, to South Africa. Yes. And it, while over there, he participated in a expat Aussie rules competition. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that was played in Johannesburg. It was mainly just to maintain his fitness. Yeah. Um, he quickly was promoted to vice captain of the Commonwealth football team. And in November of 1995, they won that premiership over there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> now he's won in two different sports, premierships two different sports, in two different sports. In two different countries. Okay. He then returned to Newcastle at the end of that competition, in, and that was when he learnt that the Northern Districts Rugby Union had lodged a protest with the New South Wales Rugby Union regarding his admission from the Australian touring team the previous year. However, there was no resolution. So in April of that year, Walsh then suddenly decided to leave the country again, this time to New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, Walsh admired the quality of football that the Kiwis played in 1903, and he wanted to play amongst them because he regarded them as the best in the world. So he wanted to test himself against the best. Mm-hmm. Um, upon arriving in Auckland, he was signed by the Parnell Club and quickly earned selection in the Auckland Province Rep Team, which toured New Zealand, South Island. He did the same thing again in 1907, which was probably the highest honour he could get while being someone, um, you know, a foreigner, I guess, to New Zealand. He couldn't play yeah. for the test team. So this is the next step down. Yeah, yeah. Um. Many believed he should have been selected in the New Zealand All-Gold squad that year to tour Australia and England, with one commentator saying, Walsh stood out as being the best player in the senior grade competition. That was from New Zealand. Wow, that's interesting. Now, the All-Golds, were that, I didn't realise that Rugby Union had an All-Gold side as well. I know, that would be the 1907 uh, professional team. Oh, okay, okay. But because he wasn't playing Rugby Union, I don't think they had a a rugby league competition set up in 1907 in New Zealand. So they would have just been picking whoever was willing to um, play professional rugby. Be part of it, yeah, yeah. Uh, And so I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have been approached Mm -hmm. because I think they wanted an all-Kiwi team. Mm -hmm. Um, But that changed when they added Downing Messenger to the side. And I think that happened when they got to to Australia anyway. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, in 1908, the Auckland Press proclaimed Walsh was the best forward in New Zealand. Oh, wow. This is, 
two and a half years after he was named as the best forward in Australia as well. So now he's the, probably the best forward in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. He was expected to be named in a rep side to face the touring British side, but was again oddly omitted. Mm. I think we're starting to get to the point now where he's pretty much, for lack of a better word, he's pretty much getting the shits. Yeah. <laughs> so it was around this time that he received a cable from James Gilton and in Sydney who asked Walsh to join the newly formed rugby league competition where he could be selected in an end-of-season tour to England. And that was the carrot that he wanted because he accepted the offer as he saw it as his last chance to, to go and visit England. Yeah, yeah. And this is where the story... <laughs> this, this is another interesting and fascinating part of this story to show you just how great he is. Because he's not played rugby league before. He's not even seen it. Mm-hmm. He was greeted at Sydney Wharf on the Saturday morning of July 18 by Secretary Henry Hoyle who then took Walsh to the Royal Agricultural Showground. Walsh was given an hour to learn the new game before lining up for Queensland against New South Wales, and Queensland lost 12-3 in his first game of rugby league. Jeez. (laughs) That's a boat On a horse and cart, told the rules on the field. You're playing for a state you've never been to, or you've never represented in your first ever game of this sport. Yeah. I wonder how many modern athletes you could do that with. I I just don't know. uh, Like... I think there'd be a lot that could do the job to a certain extent, but a lot of them would be found out like really badly. But yeah. I, I wonder how many, if you just, if you took, say, I don't, I don't know, say a Greg Inglis at his prime and put him in another sport and said, hey, these are the rules for this sport. You ever seen it? And see how he goes. Yeah. And just chuck you out there in mm. an interstate match, not even a club level game. Mm hmm. Like you're playing state level game right away. Yeah, rep rep footy immediately. Yeah. Bam, there you go. Um, he played the last two games of the season for the Newcastle Club, who wore the red and white striped jumpers of the Carlton Club. And they did that as a tribute to Pat Walsh because oh, wow. he'd, he'd been so successful there as a rugby as a rugby union player with that Carlton yeah. Club. Yeah. So that's a large reason why they wore red and white. That's very cool. Um Walsh was then a late inclusion in Giltner's squad to tour England, but was unable to get a ticket with the rest of the squad. So he had to board a second ship instead, which was the SS Salamis. It was revealed that he had brought a kangaroo with him as the team's mascot, which he <laughs> hoped but failed to train to lead the team out carrying the ball. <laughs> I wonder how long he spent before he gave up on well, trying to teach a kangaroo to do something. I'm pretty sure he would have had six weeks on that ship. (laughs) The kangaroo sadly passed away after the tour was completed on the day before the players left England to return home. Oh, wow. Once in England, Walsh was selected in the kangaroo side to play Salford. He started the game very strongly, but was moved to the backs later in the game, which met with little success for him and the Australian team. In the 11th game of the tour, Australia played uh, the Northern Union champions, Hunslet, who who had a Ford pack that was known as the Terrible Six. Oh, that's a cool name. And uh, they were led by the champion Albert Goldthorpe. Oh, uh, wow. Walsh, Walsh was the star performer, helping Australia to an impressive 12-11 victory. Wow. Uh, he played in all three of Australia's test matches against England. The first was a 22-all draw. The second, a 15-5 victory to the English. And they also won the third test, 6-5. He played in 29 of the 45-game tour including an ex- impressive performance in an exhibition game in Glasgow where he scored a skillful dribbling try, which is the uh, best way to describe that is a lot of the times what they do in the game there, uh, you, you hear about dribbling tries and all flights where they pretty much just keep soccering the ball along the ground. Yeah, now we, we talked about these sorts of plays a number of episodes ago, I think it was. It might have been, look, it might have been 200-odd episodes ago. <laughs> and it made sense when... You looked at some of the the rules that they had in place then, and the ball was very different to what we've got now. I mean, obviously it was still a rugby shaped ball, but it was a lot more rounded. They weren't as like they weren't as consistent as well, so they the bounce would be weird, and sometimes that dribbling sort of style would get your results. Exactly, and the other thing too is um, because it was still. It still looked more like rugby union today than rugby league. Mm-hmm. There was no tackle count, so if 
you know, as soon as you got tackled, instead of having the ball where everyone piles on, mm -hmm. there was still a play the ball. Mm -hmm. It was a contested play the ball, which means that the opposition dummy, or the opposition marker, could try and rake the ball out the dummy half. Yeah. Sorry, out to play the ball. Um, it also that, meant that if you made a breakaway, yeah, you had to get up and play the ball straight away. If you didn't have a hooker behind you to pick the ball up, the opposition marker could dive on the ball. Yeah. So a lot of times, dribbling the ball along until you got to the end goal was the best thing to do because you could probably score a try out of it. Otherwise, by taking a tackle, you could end up turning the ball over to the opposition. You know, the other interesting thing there was that uh, they were playing in Glasgow all the way back then. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that rugby league in those, especially those first, um, that first decade, was pretty keen to talk about expansion and moving the game on. I mean... I think I mentioned it in uh, an earlier episode that uh, Edward Larkin was, in 1910, was already looking at how to expand the game to the USA. Mm -hmm. It was only three years old in Australia. Yeah. That's just, you know, it's just the way the game was looking. It was always looking to expand. Um, while on that tour, he became the first Australian player approached by an English club, and he accepted an offer from Huddersfield who would later on play six games for at the end of the 1908-09 Kangaroo Tour. Tour manager James Gilton had stated at the time that Walsh was the finest forward in the Northern Union. Oh. Now, Gilton did have a bit of a knack for talking up the Australian players a little bit. Mm -hmm. But there, was, there hasn't been anyone that's come forward and contested that claim that mm. I could find anyway. Yeah. So... It probably holds a bit more ground. Um, in the 1909-10 season, Walsh suffered a knee injury in a game against Hull on a frozen field at Craven Park. Huddersfield paid for him to travel to London to have an innovative and rarely performed operation on his knee. His first game back was against Hull KR at Fartown, where he managed to get through the first half, displaying his uh, trademark defence, but just before full-time, he re-injured the same knee. He then travelled to Liverpool where he had the damaged cartilage successfully removed. He revealed years later, and this is a quote from, from uh, Pat Walsh himself, the club regarded me as something of a guinea pig. When my operation proved successful, they sent three other players along to have their cartilages removed as well. They'd been on the crook list and weren't game to have the operation. I had it only because I knew that if I didn't take the risk with a surgeon in England, there was no one in Australia who could help me. It's interesting because I would suggest that they don't like to take cartilage out of your knee anymore. And it just sounds like, like I can't even imagine what the surgery actually would have looked like back then. And, yeah, to, and to, it... for it to be an elective surgery as well, like this is a very different era where just getting any sort of surgery, you're really rolling the dice a little bit. And so to get an elective surgery on your knee for a sport, to, to continue to play sport, it's a it's an interesting one. Yeah, and it was he would have been one of the few people in world sport to have this operation done. Mm. Not many people would have had it done at the time. Um, he played just seven more games for Huddersfield in the 1910-11 season before returning back to Australia um, with his future wife Rebecca Eve, which was who was a lady he met while she was playing piano at a post-match function during the Kangaroo Tour. Uh, upon his arrival in 1911, he joined the Newcastle Central team and three weeks later captained the Northern Districts team on their tours in New to Queensland, where they won all three of their games. Oh, wow. He then moved to Queensland, working in a Brisbane post office. With the uh, Then he worked on the railways at Townsville, where he started coaching a local team. So he's pretty much got to the point where he's decided that his playing days are over. Mm -hmm. And it's probably a fair, fair reason for that is because his knee's probably not doing too well. Because as you said, there's only so long you'll go without any cartilage in your knee before it starts to get worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he wasn't... He didn't suffer any injuries in that period of time. Mm -hmm. I think he was just sort of winding down his career. So he'd play every like second or third week or so and just sort of in and out as, as, you, as you do, I guess. Yeah. Um, early 1915, he, he and his wife, uh, he and his future wife ended up becoming a couple and they got married just before war, um, started. 
He then enlisted with the 12th Light Horse Regiment and was promoted to corporal within two months. Whoa. And then he was transferred to a railway construction unit. His younger brother, Clem, also enlisted for service and was promoted to major and later earned a military cross. Which is, I suppose, was one of the highest honours you could get as an Australian, I guess, during World War One. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, Pat suffered a number of illnesses while on duty. One caused paralysis in his legs, which saw him require metal calipers on his legs and crutches to get around. Now, I've spoken with... Um, Someone who's worked as a medic in the army, and they think that he may have suffered polio based on what they've read on his uh, his military record. Oh, jeez, yeah, I was trying to think what would what would do that to you. Yeah, like, um, there was there was nothing on his military record that said what sort of um, ailment he had. So mm-hmm. whether it was polio or not, I don't know. That's just a a guesstimation, I guess. Far out. Um, so anyway. During the Great Depression, he would often sit on his front veranda and talk to passers-by, offering them into his house for meals if they were hungry, much to the dismay of his wife. (laughs) Um, Pat's brother, Clem, would often take him sailing around Newcastle. In 1922, his son, John, was born. John later on became a rugby union player for the Newcastle Wanderers, and he earned selection in a Newcastle rep side. But uh, that was as, as far as his career went. Mm-hmm. Um, he later became secretary of the club and just been, you know, dedicated his life to the club. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pat Walsh passed away on May 22, 1953, just three weeks after he turned 74. Um, while at Huddersfield, he was described as a grim, gaunt forward with a deadly embrace, tackles with scrupulous fairness and proportionate effectiveness. Wow, that's a nice description. <laughs> that's thorough. Yeah, that is. Um. James Gilton succinctly described Walsh as being a generous-hearted, able forward, and a sterling character. His mistreatment fueled a simmering groundswell of animosity by some players against the rugby union, which eventually led to the birth of rugby league in Australia. Despite this mistreatment, he never once complained. He became a successful player in three football codes across three different countries. A true legend. Yeah, and that, what a incredible life to lead and and all of those different environments and to succeed in those different environments at a time where just moving to a different country was, you know, such a dramatic change. It's not like these days where you kind of know what you're in for. You know, you might hear from people about what it's like living in South Africa or living in New Zealand or living in England. But, you you know, it wasn't like you could look it up in books even that easily. So, um, you know, he... He took a few chances on his with his football career, and they all panned out for him, which is shows that he was such a talented player. But yeah, just an incredible, varied life he led. Certainly was, and that's the thing too is um, this is probably hard for a lot of listeners who haven't really delved into rugby history too much. But in 1908, when the game first began in Australia, the gap between England and Australia with the playing quality and the playing styles was about as wide as what it is between Australia and England now. Mm. And that's because England had already been playing the game for 13 years. Yeah, yeah. Australia was still learning the rules, quite quite literally. Like, they got a rule book in 1908. <laughs> they were learning the rules just, just you know, a week or so before the 1908 competition started. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a famous quote from Ash Hennessy, South Sydney um, pioneer captain. He read the rule books and said, this is a game for racehorses. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, they one of the things the English did really well is they started dropping the rules that were archaic from yeah. rugby union. And, yeah, it, it must have been a, a very big change. If you've gone from being a rugby union player and then it's like, okay, this is the new game. And they hadn't seen it. Like, that's the thing I think that is really important to think about with these older stories from around the the turn of the century where these players they couldn't look at footage they in fact the best they could hope for is to maybe get a grainy picture at best um in a description or talk to somebody that has seen it and yeah it's incredible to think that you know, the first time some of these players ever saw a rugby league game was when the ball was getting kicked to them from the kickoff. Yeah, that's right. It's and you just you are literally learning on the fly. Mm. 
Oh, it's uh, it's insane. The fact you managed to learn how to play essentially three three codes of football and be successful in all three, mm. and across as you know as we were saying, like across three different countries with very different styles of playing the game, mm-hmm. he was so good he was able to dominate uh, every every single time. I think that's absolutely phenomenal. It is, and it's you know we went for a long time in sport where you kind of concentrated on one sport and there was very few multi-sport stars. And I remember like even just going back to when Michael Jordan said that he wanted to have a go at baseball and people laughed at him. Like they thought it was ridiculous. And then we've seen like footballers go and uh, do boxing. We've seen a lot of players switch between rugby union and rugby league for him to do, you know, the switch from rugby union to AFL basically in South Africa to rugby league eventually it's pretty phenomenal and to be regarded as one of the best wherever he went when he did that that's something at a completely different level yeah um regarded as as one of the best forwards in three different countries in just in the two rug, across the two rugby codes mm. just unbelievable Mm-hmm. Seriously unbelievable. Um, so his playing career stats, he played two games for the Newcastle t- club team in 1908. Mm-hmm. He played 18 games for Huddersfield where he scored three tries. That was from 1908 to 1911. Um, at rep level, he played one game for Queensland. He played three games for Newcastle, four games for Northern Division, and 26 games on the 1908-09 Kangaroo Tour where he scored nine tries. Uh, he played one game, I think, against the new might have been the Maoris. Mm-hmm. Just check that. I can't remember. Um, he also played three tests for Australia on that 1909 Kangaroo Tour. So he actually played more rep games than he did club games by quite a bit. Yeah, way more. Yeah. Uh, so all up, he played 58 rugby league games and scored 12 tries. It's pretty amazing. That's across <laughs> three and a half years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I said, like the the mistreatment he got from the New South Wales Rugby Union, it came at a time when there was a bit of a it wasn't really a movement at the time against rugby union, but there was a bit of simmering angst, I guess, mm-hmm. against how you know, some people were being treated differently to others. And it's interesting how and this is one thing that I've I've never really brought up before, but it's interesting how it was a Newcastle based movement that sort of kick-started the birth of rugby league. Yeah. And then many decades later, it was a Newcastle-based movement that brought about the merger of ARL and Super League. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. It was uh, – uh, it's interesting because you've talked uh, – there's been a number of episodes we've done where it's about this era of rugby slash rugby league in Sydney – in particular, and there are these stories where you know a play, you know player injuries and player discontent, and it just you can see where they might not be massive stories in themselves, but they've just all added up to where the the rugby union players at the time they were list they would listen to an offer when rugby league come along and said, "Hey, you want to become a professional athlete." And they were so fed up with so many different decisions that had gone against them in many different ways and their colleagues that they were willing to sit down and talk about at the very least. Yeah. And this is the thing too. is It also shows how smart James Giltonham was because he knew that some players wanted to get paid. Mm -hmm. He also knew that some players like Pat Walsh just wanted to get rep honours that they knew they deserved. Yeah. And my guess is too that he... He would have known how highly regarded Walsh was thought of and it wouldn't have hurt the rugby league cause at the time to have this guy on board, you know, with all of the influence that he would have had just in Newcastle alone. Um, but it all just generally among rugby union players at the time where they, they've they seen Walsh, you know, getting cast aside to a certain extent and then all of a sudden rugby league's embracing him. And that's a pretty big sign 
that that would have been out there for the rugby union players that were considering rugby league. Yeah, and that's the thing because they'd looked after him. He never left rugby league. Yeah, yeah. Um, and during the war, I know I didn't go into it too much, but he actually did serve um, with the light horse at Gallipoli, Palestine, and in Egypt. And he was mentioned in dispatches by the general uh, by General Allenby. So again, he wasn't just making up the numbers. He was doing some pretty bloody amazing stuff there, just serving for his country as well on the you know on the war front. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as many rugby league players did at the time. So it was just an unbelievable human. Um, Daly Messenger regarded him as, as his, um, one of the members of his favourite team of players ever. Oh, wow. That's interesting. And um, Daly and Pat Walsh's teammate, Billy Cairn, um, he also named Pat Walsh in his best all-time team in 1938, and that was including players that he hadn't played with. Oh, that's very cool. So even 30 years after the game started, he still saw Pat Walsh as the best forward in the game. Um, so, yeah, pretty phenomenal athlete. Yeah, what a life. Absolutely. And it would be... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, he literally gave everything. He ended up, ended up getting paralysis. He gave so much of himself. Yeah, it, look, it would be interesting to to have known what he thought about where rugby league was um, as the decades went on, you know, because he really would have seen the game grow. And, and I mean, there were golden eras that he saw of rugby league. It grew very quickly once it, it kind of established itself in Australia, especially. So it'd be interesting to see what he thought about all of that and what he thought about the... I guess the way that players were able to be empowered within their choices of their careers, you know, we, we still had the the system where you sort of played within the district that you lived, mm-hmm. but just to be earning money and, you know, the, the power sort of come away from the administration a little bit as it was in rugby union. Um, it'd be interesting to see what he thought about all of that. Yeah. Um, I'm I, I'm still fascinated by the fact that there was a, a, a former test player there who regarded him, if if not as an equal, if not better, to uh, Frank Burge, who'd retired at the time as well as a player. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so automatically you're seeing a player here who's considered as being pretty much on, on the same ground as an immortal. Yeah. Yet, you never hear about Pat Walsh in any of those discussions. No, no, you don't. You don't. Um, it's, it's just, it's one of those things that, that drives me to do these stories because there's another player, I, I don't know if we've def, we haven't really touched on him yet, is Jimmy Devereaux. Mm-hmm. And he was regarded as being Daly Messenger's equal through that whole 1908 Kangaroo tour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, no one never knows, no one's heard about his story. So this yeah. is the thing that motivates me to write these stories because everyone only hears of one or two players from the past and the media's got a responsibility to tell these stories and they just don't. They just stick with the well-known names and that's it. There's a lot of players out there who were doing phenomenal stuff and they were considered the equals of these immortals. Yeah, and I think also too, when you get someone like Walsh and he didn't have a a very long club career at all, like he didn't play much club footy at all. And as you say, he played way more rep football than club football. And I think when you get a situation like that, his story does become the human story rather than the, you know, we we can sit here and say, you know, this player played 200 games or this player won three premierships. But when it's a story like Pat Walsh's, it's very much about the man himself and the different experiences he had and all of his travels and things like that. And I always think about players... You know, there's some players that we will have never heard of that are are running around today who maybe started playing football in Queensland and decided, you know what, I'm going to try playing footy in France. And then they found themselves, you know, running out for some European international team because their grandparents come from there. And I always think that stories like that are really interesting because it shows that, like, this game can sometimes take you on a bit of a journey. And you don't set out on that journey to, you know, you just go along with it to a certain extent. And, you know, someone like Walsh, that seems to be a lot about 
what his story is. You know, he, he tried different things, but it wasn't like he had the goal to play three different codes in three different countries. Um, it just happened. And that's the beauty of that story is that he went out there not knowing and he achieved and, you know, his story is an amazing one because of it. He might not have all of the statistics and the trophies and the winners' medals and stuff, but damn, he, he sounded like an amazing player. Whatever football he picked up, yeah, just one of those naturally gifted athletes that yeah. you, they just come along every now and then. You could just put them anywhere and they just kick ass or whatever they do. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah. That was the other thing too. Is he had every reason to complain and kick up a stink about the way he was treated, and he just quietly went about his business. Mm-hmm. He didn't want any drama. Mm-hmm. You know, he just tried to do the right thing every time, and sometimes, well, in rugby union anyway, um, it kept biting him on the ass. It yeah. kept disrespecting him, I guess, to some degree. So that's why I dare say he was so prompt to take up the offer to go to rugby league, especially when it meant that he was going to get to play test footy and go to England. Yeah, yeah. That's all he wanted. He wasn't after the money. He wanted that recognition for, you know, I suppose he would have been reading the, the press about himself. I mean, if the media is talking about you as being the greatest player in New Zealand, the greatest player in Australia, mm-hmm. you're going to sit there and ask yourself, if I'm so damn good, why am I not playing, you know, at the international level? Yeah. So if someone comes along and says, we're going to put you in our test side, you're going to go, fuck it, I'll take it. Yeah, jump at it. <laughs> That's it. Um, and that was that was what was smart about Gilton. As I said, it's uh, he was a very smart operator like that. He knew what to, he knew what to say and who to say it to and how to say it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there were too many players he could have picked up from a dock after sitting on a boat for several hours from New Zealand and just give him a quick rundown of how rugby leagues play and then go right. Here's a state state jumper for a state you've never played for. <laughs> go out and play this new game. He gets the job done. Gets the job and just lets him go. That, that's just fascinating, that. Yeah. So that's Pat Walsh. Well, that's a really interesting story. I'm I'm glad that uh, that you've told that one on the podcast because yeah, it's a it's a really interesting one. Absolutely, yeah. One of my favourite players from the past. We've got a few more I want to get through as well. So um, we've got a long off season. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing more stories like that because. It, it, a lot of those stories have been lost a little bit and it's cool to be able to be on a podcast where, you know, having, having a historian on the podcast is fantastic for this reason because get to sit down and, and hear these, these lost stories about the game and, you know, now it's a brand new story that people can listen to. Exactly. And now it's out there for good. Yeah. Hopefully the... Uh... The name Pat Walsh is something that becomes a little bit more commonplace in rugby league circles. That's that's kind of my goal with these things. Yeah, fingers crossed. All righty. Well, people, if you want to get in touch with the podcast, you can find us on Instagram and on Twitter at Fergo Freak Pod. We're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. So get over there and subscribe and like everything as well. Um, they can also get onto the website, Freaky. Yeah, go to FergoOnTheFreak.com. And you can see all of our episodes there. Um, we've got a guest section. We've got a history section, which is this will go in the history section, obviously. And you can get in touch with us by clicking on the contact bar and sending us an email through there. Beautiful. And don't forget to give us a, a rating and a review. A five-star rating would be best. Give us a review and we'll read them out on the podcast and we'll put it up on the website as well. Um, I suppose that wraps this one up. Yeah, it's been a good one. It has indeed. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll catch us all next time.